Immortal God, Invisible God, Immortal God, How great Thou art, Immortal, Immortal God, Invisible God, Immortal God, how great thou art, immortal, mortal God. Kushina Matinde, Ilmukurunda Mukashinde, Ilmukurunda Mukashinde, how great thou art. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending the maker of heaven and earth, the Lord of hosts himself, the one who never lost a war, we worship you. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Today, once again, Lord, we're asking for mercy for all your children, for your church, for our nation, and for the world as a whole. Please, Lord, have mercy on us all. Very, very quickly, Lord, put an end to this plague. Speak to us today and let your healing power flow through your word to the whole world. Lay your mighty hands on all those who are sick. Please, out of your mercy, heal them all. And all those who are in sorrow, Father, please comfort them. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it has pleased God that we will see, be ministering to you on this Sunday. And um, we know whatever God does, He does it perfectly well. So definitely. It has a reason for whatever is happening right now. Last Sunday we were talking about thanking God for Calvary. And we mentioned four important reasons why we should praise God for Calvary. The blood that was shed for us the stripes by which we were healed, the name that's above every other name, and victory over death. I'm sure someone will ask, is that all? (laughs) Definitely not all. There's much more. Only we had limited time. Probably that's why the Almighty God has uh, brought us together again today to take a closer look at what happened at Calvary and what are the benefits of that incident for us as children. Probably one of of the greatest things that happened for us at Calvary will be found in Galatians chapter 3 from verse 13 to 14. Galatians 3 from verse 13 to 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law 
being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Quite a few things here, but we will just look at two very quickly. One is that Christ redeemed us from the cause of the law. Because he hung on a tree for us. Number two, he obtained a blessing for us. And not ordinary blessing, but the blessing of Abraham. Since we are not going anywhere, I feel that uh, we could relax and have a little Bible study this Sunday on these basic points. One, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law to he obtained blessings of Abraham for us. The mighty forces operating on earth are always in twos. Light and darkness. Life and death. As someone is dying, a child is being born. Blessings versus curses. Good versus evil. They come in twos. For example, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, the Almighty God says, I've called heaven and earth to be a witness that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. They come in twos. And then, he, of course, he gave an advice. He asked you to choose, choose life that you and your children may live. What is a curse? At one time or the other, I must have uh, discussed what a curse is with you, but since we are having a real Bible study this Sunday, we, we may as well go back and talk a little bit about what a curse is. A curse is an unseen force that hinders progress, that causes efforts to fail, with the sole aim of the destruction of the victim. I mean, you know someone is under a curse when it's almost succeeding, but never succeeds. When he tries what everybody has been doing and they are prospering, and he ends up in heavy debt. Now you know a curse. It's in action. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, find time to read it. It's not very easy reading, but read it. From verse 15 to the end. Deuteronomy 28, from verse 15 to the end. You'll be amazed 
at the terrible things that a curse can do. If you read it very closely, with anointed eyes, it will amaze you that you may see coronavirus there. But for now, if we just read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 20 and 21. Deuteronomy 28, verses 20 and 21. It says that the reason a curse comes upon anyone is to see to it that the fellow will perish quickly. Quickly. A curse is a very terrible thing. I mean, for example, Joshua pronounced a curse on Jericho. And you can read that in Joshua chapter 6. If you read from verse 20 to the end. Joshua 6, 20 to the end. You will find the result in Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2. Verse 19. 2 Kings 2, verse 19. The elders of the city said to Elisha, <laughs> Our city looks beautiful on the outside, but within, oh, we have problems. We have barrenness. We have stillbirth. We have death. We have all manners of problems. On the outside, oh, we look beautiful. You want another example of what a curse can do? Genesis 31. You can read it from verse 26 to 35. Genesis 31. From verse 26 to 35. It tells us of what happened when Jacob decided to run away from Laban to go back to his own country. And Laban decided to pursue. When he caught up with Jacob, he said, What? If you want to run away, taking my daughters with you, taking a lot of uh, animals that you got through me, why have you stolen my gods? Why have you taken my elders? Ah, Jacob said, idols, your idols. Search all my people. Anyone found with your elders, let the fellow die. Now, when Jacob was saying that, he wasn't aware that Rachel had stolen the idols and was sitting on them. So when her father searched the old place, came to her to search, she said, I'm sorry, Daddy, I can't stand up for you. Because uh, uh, it's with me after the manner of women, but you can please search everywhere. So the man searched everywhere and found nothing, not knowing that Richard sat on the idols. Now the husband has pronounced a curse. Whoever stole the idols, let the fellow die. What happened? Genesis 35, from verse 16 to 20. Genesis 35, 16 to 20. The next pregnancy of Rachel led to her death. And she was giving birth. She died. A curse flows like a river irresistibly 
I decree in the name that's above every other name that if there's any of you under any curse whatsoever, may that curse be broken now. Amen. When a curse is broken, there could be dramatic changes for the better. Because a curse is like something binding your hands, binding your feet, binding your womb, at times even binding your brain. And when a curse is broken, things change for the better. For example, in Second Kings chapter 2, that I mentioned earlier on, from verse 19 to 22, Second Kings chapter 2, from verse 19 to 22, when the people of Jericho came to Elisha and said, we have a problem. Elisha knew immediately they are under, operating under a curse. And under the inspiration of the Most High God, he decided to deal with the curse. Because af- after all, he has a higher anointing than Joshua. His own is a double portion. So he asked them to bring him salt in a new cruise. He took the salt to the source of their river. Because when a curse is pronounced on a nation, it goes to the very source to begin his uh, destructive work. Elisha threw in the salt and issued a decree. River, you are healed. No more barrenness. No more death. And the Bible said the river was healed up to today according to the word that Elisha spoke. On the authority of the Most High God, I am also speaking to all my children. Any curse that has been flowing down your family line will end today. Another illustration to show you what happens when a curse is uh, broken can be found in Genesis 49. From verse 1 to 7. Genesis 49. From verse 1 to 7. Jacob was about to die. He called all his children together. And began to decree. Upon each and every one of them. Started with the firstborn. And the firstborn had done a lot of evil. And so the father pronounced on him that even though he's the firstborn, he won't excel. And then he turned on the next two. One of the two is a fellow called Levi, who had also done some serious damage uh, to the reputation and joy of their father. He said because they were of violent temper, he said they will be scattered in Israel. But then something happened along the line. In Exodus 32, Verse 15 to 26, Exodus 32, 15 to 26. When Moses was coming down from the mountain where he had gone to collect the Ten Commandments, and while he was gone, the people said, This fellow has been gone for all these days. We are not sure he's coming back because. 
Where he has gone, that's the mountain of God. Uh, people don't go there. Well, let's make, a, let's make us a God. Something we can see, something we can worship like other God, other nations. And so they made an idol. And they were worshipping the idol of gold. Dancing naked before the idol. When Moses and Joshua came down from the mountain. And the anger of Moses boiled over. And he decided that he would punish these people for the evil they have done. But he was quite aware of the kind of people they were. Even when there was no problem, there have been occasions when they had threatened to stone him. So he knew he couldn't face these people alone. So he stood at the gate and cried out, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. In other words, he said, I'm not sure every one of you wants to worship this idol. If you're on the Lord's side, come unto me. And every member of Levi's family crossed over to Moses' side. And through them, he executed judgment on the idol worshippers. And God looked down from heaven and said, "Ah, ah, Levi, of all people, you're my side. God said, in that case, I'm on your side also. So that by the time we get to... Numbers chapter 3, if we read it from verse 5 to 13, Numbers chapter 3, from verse 5 to 13, God said to Moses, Cause Levi to draw near me. I've chosen them as my firstborn. The father said they will be scattered, but I said, No. I will draw them near. If there is a curse operating in your life that has been making it difficult for you to stay strong in the Lord, I decree that that curse be broken right now. Amen. Now, at Calvary, Jesus delivered us from the causes of the law. But he didn't stop there. He replaced the causes which are written in Deuteronomy 28 from verse 15 to the end with blessing. And not ordinary blessing now, but the blessings of of Abraham. And let me talk briefly about what is a blessing. What does he do? Because a blessing is the other or the opposite of a curse. A blessing is a summon to all forces in heaven on earth, underneath the earth, all forces to gang up to support somebody so that that fellow will succeed. A good illustration you will find in Genesis 27 from verse 22 to 29, Genesis 27, from verse 22 to 29, tells you what happened when Isaac was blessing Jacob in error. He told him that the deal of heaven will happen. He told him that the fatness of the earth will come to his aid. He told him that men 
we will serve him. It didn't even stop there. It said nations will serve him. If you read that passage very well, you will see that if there are children of the same mother, and one is blessed and the others are not, all the others will serve the one that is blessed. Is there in that passage I ask you to read? The power of a blessing is tremendous. <laughs> I just tell you a little bit of it. One, it leads to rapid promotion. Everything you touch will just keep on succeeding, succeeding, succeeding. So much so people, people are bound to ask, how are you doing your own? When a man is cursed, he will be walking like an elephant, he be eating like a rat. When a man is blessed, even if he's walking like a rat, he be eating like an elephant. It's just the other way around. Proof. In Genesis 48, from verse 8 to 20, Genesis 48, from verse 8 to 20, when Jacob was old and Joseph brought his sons to him for blessing. Manasseh, the firstborn, Ephraim, the secondborn. And Joseph placed the firstborn where the right hand of his father will fall so he can get a double portion blessing that belongs to firstborn and place Ephraim, the secondborn, where the left hand will fall. And Buddy had asked me, why is the right hand more important in blessing than the left? <laughs> I told the fellow, I don't know. All I know is, if a man of God is going to bless two of you, put your head where the right hand will fall. You get the blessing first. <laughs> when we get to heaven, probably we'll find out why God did it that way. And so, Jacob crossed his hand and placed his right hand on the head of Ephraim, the younger one, the left hand on the head of Manasseh, the firstborn. Uh, Joseph saw it and said, no, my father, because the eyes of Jacob had become dim because of old age. So Joseph tried to correct him and say, hey, daddy, you are making him. He said, no, I'm being guided by the Holy Spirit. I pray for someone today that the Holy Spirit himself will direct a double portion of blessing to your head. Amen. And so he blessed the two of them. He said, don't worry, the both of them are blessed, but uh, the younger will be more successful than the elder. By the time we get to Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, the Bible tells us that when you are counting the children of Manasseh, and you count a thousand. By the time you are counting the children of Ephraim, you will count ten thousand. So the younger had prospered ten times more than the elder because of the blessing. Number two, when you are blessed, no 
human being can cause you. As you say, if God blesses you, mm -hmm. no witch, no wizard, no false prophet can place a curse on you and expect the curse to stick. It won't. Numbers 23 verse 8. Numbers 23 verse 8. If you like, you can read it from verse 1. But verse 8 is the important verse there. When the king called Balak, or Balak, depending on how you want to pronounce his name, summoned a prophet called Balak, or Balak, to come and pronounce a curse on the children of Israel. And there you, again you see the importance of the curse. Because Balak said to Balaam, I know if you curse these people, I will be able to wipe them out. Put a curse on my enemy. If we go to fight, and then I know I will defeat them. When Balaam opened his mouth, he said, how can I curse someone that God has not cursed? If God does not curse you, and somebody says he's cursing you, he's wasting his time. I mean, if the fellow cursing you, <laughs> uh, has no backing of God, no delegated authority from God to curse you, you'll be wasting his time. But there are people that have delegated authority to curse. And it will stick. Um, I don't want to... <laughs> I know we're at home. I know I can take as much time as I want, but I don't want to take too much time. The husband can cause his wife and it will stick. Like the example I've already given you. Uh, Jacob versus his wife. A father can cause you and it will stick because he has parental authority. Mm -hmm. A pastor can curse you if you do something deserving of a curse. Because the Bible says, a curse, curseless shall not come. If you don't do anything deserving of a curse, it doesn't matter. The anointing of that fellow is not going to work. If a pastor curses you and you go to the one who ordained the pastor, or someone with a superior anointing, he can throw away that curse. I've shown you Elisha versus the curse of Joshua. <laughs> if the channel of Isaiah curses you, uh, you have to appeal to Jesus Christ for that curse to be removed. I always say it jokingly. The general vassal causes you. Maybe if you fast for 30 days and 30 nights, crying to God, and God may say, all right, I will talk to my son. Of course, if God causes you, well, you know, that matter is settled. Who are you going to appeal to? When you are blessed by God, no one can curse you. Not only that. If God blesses you, when your enemy opens his mouth to pronounce a curse, it is a blessing that will be flowing out. Numbers 23, verse 9 to 12. Numbers 23, verse 9 to 12. Instead of Balaam cursing Israel, he just kept on <laughs> blessing them. 
<laughs> Balak said, I brought you to curse these people. You are blessing them. Ah, yeah, okay, if you are not going to curse them, then don't bless them. But then the really significant thing about what happened at Calvary is not only that Jesus destroyed the curse for us, he obtained for us Abraham's blessings. Particularly those of us who are Gentiles. And many of my colleagues rejoice at this passage. Oh, we like it. We love the blessings of Abraham. But we don't want the responsibilities that go with it. Uh, that's, a, that's another topic for another time. Let's look at uh, the blessings of Abraham. You will find them written in Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. The Almighty God said to Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house, leave your country, uh, leave your relations, go to where I'm going to send you. And then I will do the following seven things. Number one, he said, You will become a great nation. And Jesus obtained that blessing for us. Do you know that according to Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 11 Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 11 No matter how great you are right now You can be a thousand times greater Can you see yourself a thousand times greater than you are now? If you can see it, you can have it That's why I always smile when some people try to convince me that uh, I've arrived. That's why I keep telling them, I've not even started. And the same will be true for all my children. A very quick illustration will show you how quickly you can multiply. In Genesis 46, from verse 26 to 27, Genesis 46, from verse 26 to 27, the Bible tells us that all the children of Israel that came to Egypt were 70 in number. But by the time they were leaving Egypt, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, Exodus 12, verse 37, there were 600,000 men without counting the children. 600,000 men. You can imagine how many there are when you had their wives and their children. The Almighty God can multiply you a thousand times more than you are now. Number two, God said to Abraham, not only will I make you a great nation, I will bless thee. Not I may bless thee. I will. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 Proverbs 10 verse 22 says the blessings of the Lord make it rich and added no sorrow with it. Hmm. When God was saying to Abraham I will bless thee Abraham had nothing. When he was leaving home, he left himself, his wife, and uh, took Lot with him. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 24, 
verses 34 and 35, Genesis 24, 34 and 35, the servant of Abraham said, I am Abraham's servant, and God has blessed my master greatly. He has flocks, he has silver, he had gold. And the blessings of Abraham is mine and is yours. Which is a definite assurance that if you remain steadfast in this Lord God Almighty, this Jesus Christ who hung on the tree for you at Calvary, there's no way you can die poor. Number three, God said to Abraham, I will make your name great. Well, you say, well, uh, how can that happen to me? Oh, if you are a Christian, if you are a true Christian, you are named after Christ According to Acts chapter 11 verse 26. Acts 11 verse 26. And so, you already have a name that is above every other name at your disposal. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11. The name of Jesus is a name that is above every other name. There's no greater name in heaven and on earth. And believe me honestly, there's no greater name than the name Christian. Because you have a Christian, you're a child of Christ. And when the child mentions his name, things happen. I mean, if the son or daughter of the president comes to your office and uh, you have told your secretary, I don't want to see anyone, and the fellow comes in and he says, I am so, 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 so. (laughs) The secretary comes in and he tells you that the fellow outside there is the daughter of the president. You will see somebody. There are names that open doors. And from now on, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your name too will be opening doors. And then God went on to say to Abraham, He said, not only will you become a great nation, not only will I bless you, not only will I make your name great, you shall be a blessing. Every Christian has been given authority from heaven to be a blessing. Matthew chapter 18 verse 18. Matthew 18 verse 18 says, you have the power to bind and the power to loose. That's a lot of power. You use it appropriately everywhere you go. People will be blessed. And God went on to say, I will bless those who bless you. And that means your friends are in for a good time. Because in Mark chapter 9 verse 41, Mark 9 verse 41, it says, anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink will not go unrewarded. Just a cup of water to you. That's how much blessing is giving you. He said, there will be a reward. And then he went on to say, I will curse him that curseth thee. (laughs) That means you don't even need to waste your time. Praying against your enemies. They are already in trouble. 
if it's only because of Galatians chapter 6 from verse 7 to 8, Galatians 6 from verse 7 to 8, the law of harvest, that says, whatsoever a man sows, he shall reap. And the harvest is always more than the seed sown. So those who wish you evil are already in trouble. And then, finally he said, In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It won't be just a blessing to your family, but it will be a blessing to the whole world. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus Christ said to the disciples, He said, All power in heaven and on earth have been given unto me, so you now go to the whole world and be a blessing to them. And I will back you up. Now the question comes, why did Jesus go to the cross? Why Calvary? Why did he go there to die for you and for me? Because according to John chapter 10 verse 18, John chapter 10 verse 18, he says, I'm doing this thing voluntarily. He said, I lay down my life. Nobody is taking it from me. Um, volunteering. Why? John 15 verse 13. John 15 verse 13. He says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Why did he go on the cross for you and for me? Love. He loves you. He loves me. As a banner we used to carry when I was a younger Christian and I I still see it once in a while. Smile, Jesus loves you. <laughs> in one of the money devotion in open heavens, we were studying the story of a Ruth where the mother in law said uh, the daughter in law should go back. And uh, one went back, Ruth says, I, I'm not going back. And I told my children in the morning, I think maybe yesterday or the day or some days ago. I said, the elders have a saying, the African elders, no matter how terrible the situation may be, there will be at least one fellow who will stand by you. You may not know the fellow. But I said, I know the one who would definitely stand by me. I said, his name is Jesus. Because I said, even a human being who will say, I will stand by you, whatever may come, if it comes to the question of passing through fire, they will back out. But Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The love is so great. And so what does he expect from you as a response to that kind of love? In John 15 from verse 9 to 14, John 15 from verse 9 to 14, he made it clear. A very simple language. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 15 from verse 9 to 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. And if it pleases God, we'll probably pick this study up from here next 
Sunday as we talk about the secret of unending success. But for now, what is your response to the love of the one who loves you so much that he died for you? And all he's asking for is obedience. Obey me, that's all. Are you obedient to him? Do you do everything he asks you to do? Or are you still holding back from him? Examine yourself today. And if you have to change your ways, change your ways. He loved you so much, he died for you. Respond in such a manner that will make him happy. And for those of you who have never tasted this love, the invitation is still there. You say, come to me. Oh, ye that labor and a heavy lady, I give you rest. David said, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's no love like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no friend like him. When everybody else is walking out, Jesus will stand by you. But if he's stretching out his hand of love to you and you say you don't want, he won't force you. But do yourself a favor. The best friend you can ever have is the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are listening to me anywhere in the world and you want to respond to his love by surrendering your life to him, I will ask you that you bow your head now. And I will be praying for you in a moment. And after you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, please find a way of communicating with me so that I will know you have done this so I can continue to pray for you. So all of you who want to give your life to Jesus, please bow your head and talk to him and say, Oh, God of love, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for dying for me. I surrender my life to you. Please receive me. Save my soul. Forgive all my sins. And I'll be your friend for the rest of my life. Talk to him. And those of us who have already given our life to Jesus, please intercede for these newcomers. Pray that the one who saved your soul will save their own souls also. Pray that as they have come to taste the Lord, they will find them very, very good, very, very sweet. Pray that once they surrender their life to him today, they will never look back. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. My Father, my God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for this period when we could have time to study your word. Thank you for everything you did for us at Calvary, particularly for redeeming us from curses and giving us the blessings of Abraham. All these, your children, all over, who have surrendered their life to you today, please receive them. Forgive all their sins. Save their souls. Write their names in the book of life. Receive them into the family of God. And I pray that from now on, 
Each time they cry unto you, you answer them by fire. Amen. Father, I'm committing not only the new ones, but every one of us into your hands today. Let curses become stranger to us. Amen. And let us begin to enjoy all the blessings of Abraham. Amen. Thank you, my Father and my God. You, In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.